that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 455th edition of Energy Week with Lucky 455. Is that really true? <laughs> and Not Tom so Fennell. This morning. What? Not so far this morning. Oh. <laughs> Tom had problems with his car. So, um, yes, I every. <laughs> Let's start out right. Every uh, day I get up and I do, I do the news, put the news uh, bits that I find into into my blog, geoharvey.com, and uh, 10 to 15 items, usually 15 items. And then once a week, Tom and I get together and talk about the best of all the of The best of the blog. The best of the blog. And uh, that's what it's all about. If you go down on the screen on the device that you're watching this on, you'll probably come to a link to the to the uh, website that we use to put all of this together, and you can click on on the on the links there, or you can go to geoharvey.com, find the material that we've got by looking at the date on the calendar. We're starting this week. We're recording on the 27th of January, and of course, we're starting the week earlier. So we're starting on the 20th of January, which is a Thursday. Um, and I have to remind everybody, in order to keep this show going, we need to get um, donations to BCTV. And identify that they're going to this show. Yeah. So go to BCTV, BrattleboroTV.org, uh, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find a button you can click on that says Support Local Broadcasting. And you go to that and... Um, you can donate using a credit card or PayPal. I believe they prefer PayPal. I prefer PayPal. It's, I think it's much more secure than the credit cards. Probably. Yeah, although I did have my credit card hacked. Did about, you? Yeah, about a year ago. And I got a very nice note from People's United that said, we would think that these different people who are charging your card for meals in California are probably not you. <laughs> and... Uh, they, they absorbed the cost. I didn't have to pay anything. They that, probably have some kind of insurance. They probably do. That was, but that was People's United, which I always call the com Communist Bank, although because of the name People's. Yeah. But People's goes back to like the time of Andrew Jackson when they were talking about... They were about, really people, huh? They were really people, <laughs> yeah. It was the bank was for ordinary people. Okay. As opposed to the Merchants Bank. Which or, was for business. Which was for business. Or the, the what other banks would there have been? I don't know. Anyway, you if you're going to donate some money to BCTV to support the show, be sure that you go to the box that's, uh, that gives allows you to give a message to BCTV and say that it's to support Energy Week. We don't well, need a huge amount. I pop, I, I pop up and I see that some of these things are well worth seeing. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a link at the end of uh, your, your your blog, I guess, yeah. to, to look them up. And yeah. Some of them, I would almost say, are mandatory. I mean, yeah, if you're going to understand. They're so full of depth and, yeah. and interesting stuff. If you're going to understand what's going on in energy, some of these are really important. So should we get going? I guess Which, we well, should. Can't dance. As you, that's your line. I'm sorry, I stole it. Okay, we've got an item from CNN, and we've got a picture of a Chinese coal miner. He needs a laundry. <laughs> needs a laundry, yeah, indeed, he does. He does not look like a happy man. He's kind of, I guess he's coming from work, but he's kind of dirty. Well, now, that's what say, coal miners do. How do you get this thing do. to scroll? Come on, you. What have you got for a... Uh, Okay, dingo, it's, it's, <laughs> scroll, it's scrolling, it's scrolling. <laughs> okay. That, for those that want to guess, that's a Chinese coal miner. I think we already said that. And the article says, and I quote, <laughs> China mined a record amount of coal in 2021. It might produce even more this year. 
That goes against what we've been talking about. That's yeah. absolutely. And, you know, China declared war on coal uh, several years ago, and it looks like they've been losing. China produced more coal than ever last year as it powers, as its power stations struggle to meet demand for electricity, undermining plans to curb, curb carbon emissions. Coal output hit a record 4.07 billion metric tons. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> That is 4.07 gigatons. It certainly is. And a gigaton is a bigaton. <laughs> <laughs> Up 4.7% from 2020. Output may increase this year. It ain't over yet, guys. <laughs> no, it ain't over yet. The year's just starting. I mean, you know, I don't understand why people want to continue paying for the cost of fuel when they don't have to anymore. <laughs> I, you know, the, the, the things that go on in China are, are complex. They are very complex. We can't understand them. I don't think the Chinese can understand well, them. Well, I think that's part of the problem, is that they, they, they've got a situation that is, you know. Well, there's a neat video in this article on CNN. Yes. And it's about China versus the U.S. Yeah. Who can lead the change in combating the climate crisis? It's, it's three and a half minutes just worth looking at. Yeah. Well, China is already the world's largest coal producer and consumer. It's going to need even more of the fossil fuel to power its economic recovery. However, just a year ago, the country was touting aggressive measures meant to seriously curb its emissions. They put them on a the back burner. Yeah. The world's insatiable appetite for electricity is setting us up for a climate disaster. Yes. Absolutely. Should we go on? I think so. There's more. Our next, uh, up our next piece here Let's is from Clean Technica, this, uh, and we have a we have a picture here. here. Tom and I have been at odds over what this picture is. He says it's his bedroom. I say it's my <laughs> living room. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for a it title? Looks, it looks kind of dismal, though, doesn't it? Boy, you? doesn't it ever! Whoever abandoned that factory really left a mess behind. They shouldn't have done that. That was well, mean. The, the title of the picture is "Victim of Transition." Yes. And it's abandoned, an abandoned factory. But the title of the article is, and I quote, Greening the Rust Belt, an unexpected link between manufacturing jobs and sustainability. Yeah, and this is an interesting article. This I is thought. a good article. Research suggests that communities may that have seen st steep reductions in manufacturing jobs are less likely to adopt plans related to environmental sustainability, highlighting the role that economic transitions play in fostering sustainability that, that's efforts. That's interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. It's like uh, we got, we've, we've got problems with jobs here, so we're not going to look for sustainability. And the fact of the matter is the sustainability produces its own jobs. Well, here's from the article. While adopting a plan can signal that sustainability is important to a given community, it's also important to look at the concrete steps and outcomes that a community can demonstrate. Right. Okay. More? That's enough for that one. Let's see if I can't scroll on to something else. Well, I've, I've just put up the, uh, the wind farm. I'm just at, at the computer. That is there. a mid-American wind, wind farm. Yeah, let's get a picture of that. We've already got it. We had it. People saw it. There it is. <laughs> this is from Renews. Well, according to the article, that's a wind farm. Yes. And there's lots of green in the picture. Which, yes. Which tells us a lesson. You can have uh, your cake and eat it, too. <laughs> yeah, if this so you can have a, your farm and you can put up wind, windmills. Absolutely. What do you got for a title for the article? Mid American, which is a company, unveils a 2.1 gigawatt, that's bigawatt, Iowa Clean Power Project. Mid American Energy has plans for a $4 billion renewable energy pro project in Iowa, including wind and solar generation. In a filing with the Iowa uh, Utilities Board, Mid American proposed uh, Mid American's proposed project would add 2.042 gigawatts or 2,042 megawatts of wind generation and 50 meg megawatts of solar to be completed in 2024. Well, the project is called Wind Prime. Yes. Okay, and it's projected to result in an overall reduction of carbon dioxide by 75%. So it's not too shabby. No. 
And when prime has the, but I, I, I emphasize prime because it's all capital letters. Here. Yes, okay. <laughs> has the potential to deliver 100% renewable energy. Yes, you're allowed to shout, by the way. <laughs> um, but let's look at Friday coming up. Oh, if you want to go straight to Friday. Sure. By wanna, the way, I should mention Mid-American is part of, um, is part of um, Warren Buffett's uh, oh, is it? Huh? This yeah. is one of Warren Buffett's investments. It's one, yeah, that's right. This is only investment in power, isn't it? I, I don't think so. I uh -huh. think Mid-American is just an investment that's in the Midwest, and he's got other investments. On, on power. <coughs> yes, yeah. that's right. Okay, Friday. Here's a guy out in the snow carrying a rifle. Oh, there he is. <coughs> a Russian soldier in the snow. And by the way, all that Cyrillic um, stuff that comes after that means... Um, Russian De Defense Department photo. I don't. I don't even see that <laughs> in the title of the of the um, on the on the. Ah photograph. yes, 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 yes. There's a bunch yes, of Cyrillic Russian stuff. Language. I don't know how to pronounce Cyrillic. I could I could guess at it because I can pronounce Greek. But you know, go ahead. This is from CNN. Gas prices could soar if Russia invades the Ukraine. If Russia invades the Ukraine, inflation-weary Americans will likely pay the price at the pump. That's because Russia is the number two oil producer on the planet behind only the United States. And Ukraine is a key energy hub where a large amount of Russian natural gas exports to Europe flow through. This is utterly unreal. It's so crazy. Um, Russia is the number two exporter of oil. Yeah. Two thirds of its money comes from oil. Comes from <laughs> oil and natural gas. <clears throat> and where do they ship that? Through the Ukraine, which they want to invade as a military thing. In other words, they want to make a war <laughs> against the organ the country. That sh transships all of their fuel. That, that doesn't make sense. Does it? No, this does not make sense. Now, it's interesting because I've been listening to Vermont Public Radio. Yeah, and it's all about this. Boy, they're talking more and more about this. Well, the people people should understand this, but I think Vladimir Putin is a bully. I yeah. think a lot of people would agree with me on I that. I think so. And like mo most bullies, he's motivated by two things. One is he doesn't understand how to motivate people other than through fear. And yes. the second thing is he's scared. Yes. And what is he scared of? He's scared of losing income because the world is moving away from the fuels that, that he's he selling. Is selling, right. And he hasn't got the imagination that you need to realize that Russia has got resources that are just mind-boggling, and he could be supplying the world with a large part of its uh, its materials for the energy transition. Well, Russia is still an enigma, really. It, it, the Chinese make better sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a quick couple of quick takeaways. An invasion would trigger immediate fears of sanctions of Russia's vast energy resources. Yeah. Damage to the region's energy infrastructure and raise the specter of Vladimir Putin, who's he? Weaponizing exports of natural gas and crude oil. But he's already doing that. He and doesn't he sort have of to invade to do that. Well, oil prices have already shot up to a seven-year high. Which means that he makes more money selling the oil. He does. Than, you know. Well, inflation is a major problem already. The recent increases in gasoline prices threaten to further, further aggravate inflation. And a hundred dollar oil in a Russia Ukraine conflict would make it even worse. Like I say, that's all they're talking about on Vermont Public Radio. Well, it's, it's scary. I know it's scary. I honestly think that most of the people at VPR and other places don't understand it. Um, and the reason they don't understand it is because the the big issue here is the fact that Vladimir Putin is scared. That, to me, is the They're big issue. They're not talking about that part of it at all. No. <laughs> and, you know, I think that there, there are better ways to deal with this than to... There, Vladimir Putin has got better ways to deal with it than to fight about it. Well, we got a little bit of a graph here that we'll look at briefly while we're talking about it. Okay. That is the U.S. energy-related carbon dioxide emissions from 2000 to 2023. Yeah. And I want to point out... They've been out, going down pretty steadily. they got a little jump now. 
I want to point out that the, the bottom line on this graph is 4,000. So there's a lot of the graph that you don't see it. So you don't even see, right? It's, it's, that's, that's kind of uh, de deceptive. Yeah. The other thing is that the overall slope of this graph is still down, even though we've had bump up in yeah, 2021. The overall slope 20, is definitely down. The overall slope is down. Now, the third thing is the um, this graph really has to be far steeper than it is. Steeper? It's, it's got to go down much, much faster. More than this, huh? Yeah. The, the amount that it went down between 2019 and 2020, that's about the rate at which it should be going down. The problem is we're not doing enough. It's been going down to, pretty gradually and yeah, it started it's going much down too steeply gradual. and it's rebounded now. Much too, too gradual. We've still got no control of this of this thing. Well, the, ar the article is entitled, and I quote, U.S. energy-related carbon dioxide emissions expected to increase in 2022 and 2023. Yeah, this, Not necessarily good news. No. This is from Clean Technica. In its latest short-term energy outlook, the Energy Information Administration forecast that U.S. energy-related CO2 emissions will increase in 2022 and 2023, but remain below 2019 levels. I left the, the uh, graph up there. Yeah, the emissions had decreased 11% in 2020 due to COVID-19. Well, as the U.S. economy began to return to pre-COVID activity, yeah. carbon dioxide emissions increased. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this yes. will continue, but gradually. Yes. Coal CO2 emissions will fall by 3% in 2022 and remain mostly flat in 2023. I don't believe it. I would expect to go to go down further. Yes, I absolutely agree. The Energy Admin Information Administration, which is supposed to be, it's part of the DOE, supposed to be advising Congress, um, has made a lot of projections about the direction um, in the future of various things that happen to be demonstrably way off. And I don't think... They're not, you wouldn't suggest they're influenced by anybody. No, I don't think they are. I think, <laughs> I think it's just... They're just calling it as they see it. They are, they are restricted by certain things. They're not, allowed to, they're not allowed to use their intuition or guess at anything. They have to say, if, to have if the current part. conditions continue, mm -hmm. Even if a law is coming along and you know that it's going to change things, they're still going to go with current conditions. That's how they do things. And so they come up with the results that they come up with. But I would expect that they're right on natural gas and carbon emissions in general. But I think that, I think that coal is going to decline faster than they Well, it's not think. economical. No. It's the bottom economical. line. The bottom, it's the eco economic stupid. That's right. Okay, should we go on, Tom? Yeah, we got another picture coming up this here. This is I'm a solar array by is that Duke, that is? Duke uh, <laughs> Energy, and, and there it is. Yes, that's what it's it is. It's a nice little solar array. It looks rather large from the size of the picture. Yeah, it does. It also looks pretty clean, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. They must pay somebody to walk, walk up there and clean them. Either that or they got goats. Well, I think it's people because I see <laughs> on the left there, there's a track that looks like it comes yeah. from a vehicle. Oh, definitely. They, they keep them clean. They keep it clean, yeah. Well, Verizon signs a power deal for 910 megawatts of new renewables. Yep, this is from Renews. The Renews articles are all very short. They're usually you, pretty good. Yeah, they are pretty good, but they're pretty short. <clears throat> U.S. telecoms provider Verizon has entered into virtual power purchase agreements, plural, equating to a total of 910 megawatts. That's almost point, a gig. Almost a gigawatt. Of capacity, Verizon's seven new renewable energy purchase uh, agreements are expected to help finance the powering of the seven new solar and wind facilities. Well, it should be evident, but these are basically powering Verizon's phone network. Yeah, yeah. You were going to say something. No, I'm. Well, I'm, one of the facilities will be in Texas. Yes. Two in Pennsylvania. Well, in the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland market, which is like one market, yeah, and a facility in California, they're all expected to be full, uh, fully operational by mid-2024. This is the way these things work. If you want a lot of energy and you want it fast, you put up solar and wind power. 
If you want a lot of energy and you want it to, to take forever and cost too much, then you then put you up a nuclear, nuclear plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move along here to Saturday, January 22nd. Yep. And we got a funny looking picture here. Yeah, what's funny Somebody about it? Somebody tell us what it is. Well, that's a wind turbine. <laughs> okay, and this comes from Power Technology. Uh, Ersted. Let me, let me get the... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Ersted signs MOUS, Memor huh, Memorandums of Understanding, not mouse, <laughs> to develop <laughs> offshore wind farm in South Korea. Ah, oh, they're getting around. They are. Danish energy company Ersted signed Memoranda. I want to point out, the plural is not memorandums. It's memoranda. It's, memoranda. it's, it's like data it's Latin. is the plural. One of them is datum. Well, datum is singular. Data That's is right. plural. And the other one, which doesn't come from Latin, is phenomena. And the singular phenomenon. is phenomenon. <laughs> but that comes from Greek. Greek. Um, Erstad signed memoranda of understanding with Korea Southern Power and Korea Midland Power to develop the Incheon uh, offshore wind project in South Korea. The offshore wind facility will have a capacity of 1.6 gigawatts. Bigawatts. Bigawatts, which is enough for 1.3 million households. And that's not quite as, uh, it's not going to produce quite as much electricity as a, as a large nuclear power plant. But it'll, it'll come close, maybe. Well, you're not paying for fuel. You're not paying for fuel. And let's take a look at the uh, wind wind turbine again. I mean, it's pretty yeah. pretty simple there. That's a pretty simple wind turbine. That's right. Okay. Well, there's, there's I got a quick takeaway. Here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. This facility is related to the Korean Green New Deal. Yes. Which focuses on renewable energy, green infrastructure, and the industrial sector. Okay, there so you they go. got a Green New Deal. It will support the South Korean government's green energy transition efforts and will require a total investment of more than $800 million. It will be located 40 miles from the Incheon coastline. That's to, it, kind of amazing. Do they have a broad continental shelf there? I don't think they do, but uh, it's, Is this floating they may terms? have a small continental shelf. Uh. That, that makes sense. Okay, should we move on? I think we should, yeah. Okay, we have a picture here of a UK battery factory. And if you if you look at the left side, I'm sorry, the right side of that factory, you'll see that there's square things, and then there's rectangular things that kind of stick out of the factory. Those rectangular things are tractor, tractor trailers, I believe. Oh, well, on the right-hand side? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what they are. Yeah. And it's hard to get the idea of the scale of this factory. It's huge. But uh, there are trees <laughs> there. Yeah, the trees. Okay, and the trees will give it to you. This is about four-story building, three-story building. Yeah. And it's very, very large in square footage. Yes, and it's also got solar panels all over the roof. All over the place. This is from all Power Technology. Place. What do you have for an article? Massive. I'll say that again. Massive. Massive UK battery factory receives $2.3 billion in funding. Yeah. UK-based ba battery manufacturing startup. This is a startup doing this. British <laughs> Volt has announced a $2.3 billion, which is 1.7 billion pounds of funding, for a proposed battery gigafactory. British Volt plans to produce 30 gigawatt hours of battery capacity per year from its 93 hectare site in Blythe, Northumberland. So this is 93. Well, a gigawatt hour is what? A, a million gig? A, it's a billion gig, billion kilowatt hours, it's, isn't it? No. It's a million, it's a million, million kilowatt, kilowatt hours. hours, yes. We're getting kicked with that kilo. Is that yeah, it? you got you got to watch those things. They sneak those letters in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's a half of a square mile. I'm going to look at it again. Well, the problem is the that, site... That factory's a half a square well, mile. Well, no, not the factory, the site. And so the factory occupies a large part of the site, but how much of the site it occupies, I don't know. I would guess, looking at this, that... Well, there's roads that define, I guess, the site. Yeah, but so it's I It's not think, much bigger than that, the site. Yeah, well, okay. Well, investment will come from the UK's Automotive Trans Transformation Fund, 
which is designed to grow the electric vehicle industry ahead of the 2030 ban on combustion-only vehicles. That's for Britain. Yeah. They're going to ban... They've got a law. They're going to ban new ones. I mean, they're, they're gonna, ban, not going to tell you you can drive ones. your old car. But you know, I'll tell you something. That's coming. If they stop making new ones in, 19, in 2030, yeah. the ones that are on the road are going to have... F after that, they're going to get progressively... It's going to be progressively more difficult to find gasoline, oh, and yeah. oil, and people to service them, and you know. Well, this fund also provides for expansion of a competitor plant in Sunderland, which is owned by the Chinese company Envision. This plant currently supplies batteries to the car manufacturer Nissan. So these yeah. guys are getting ready. They're getting ready. That's right. Okay. And by the way, it's an aside here. The location has access to a deep sea port facility and renewable energy uplinks. There you so go. They're getting ready for the future. Yeah, they are. Okay, we and have nice an item here, here from Clean Technica. Oh, the picture came up already. Yeah, my goodness, you know, you're ahead of me. It's magic. <laughs> that what? is Cayuga, Cayuga Lake in the background. This yep. is the town of Ithaca. Ithaca. And we used to sing in college far. Above Cayuga's waters, there's an awful smell. Oh, no. <laughs> Some think it's their Cayuga's waters. We think it's Cornell. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Natural gas becomes an important background in a transition from fossil fuels. Battleground, Tom. You said background. Battleground. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm glad you're following, you're, you're following it. Well, I pay attention. I, I don't always pay attention perfectly, but sometimes I pay attention. This is from Clean Technica. How do I get you? Last there, year right? saw natural gas bans as cities lead the way in phasing out gas from homes and buildings. Ithaca, New York, became the first city to go further and lay out an ambitious policy to transition all bans. Uh, I'm sorry, all buildings to electric by 2020, uh, 2030 rather. That's not that far away. That's not at all. Some states are pushing back on these bans, but they're going to they're going to ban natural gas use not just in the in new buildings, but in in buildings where it hasn't been where it's already well, in the use. The word is phasing out. They're phasing it out. That's right. Let me read a couple of things here. Okay, go ahead. Gas faces significant challenges in remaining a long term part of our fuel mix. Yes, it's virtually impossible to make significant quantities of it renewably. While clean electricity, along with the efficient machines to use it, gets less expensive and more widespread by the year. Yeah. 2022 will most likely continue this trend toward phasing out natural gas. Yeah. Many cities have banned gas out, out, outright in new construction and are likely to phase it out in existing buildings. Yes. Now, there's an aside here because they talked about induction stove technology. And I never heard about induction stove technology. Oh, well, you no, know, you can get induction stove. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. Oh, please do. <laughs> it creates sure. a magnetic field that directly heats iron in pans. Yes. So that rather than heating the space under a pan like a traditional stove, they're heating the pan. They're more efficient than gas or electric. Energy transfer is around 85% compared to 75% with the older technologies. They cook food faster, they heat up, turn heat up and down instantaneously, they offer precise temperature control, they only work when a magnetic pan is placed on top of them. Which so means a regular, a regular pan, you know, if you have work. an aluminum pan or something, it's, gonna not, work. it's not going to be anything. iron. Yeah. But these things are very efficient. And well, right now, they're very safe, they're very efficient, and they're very expensive. Yeah. But that'll come down. It will. You know, it reminds me of microwaves because... Yeah, they used when, to be very expensive. The, yeah, and, but now when microwaves first them. appeared, yeah, because I was with a group of people who were very interested in energy, and this is going back to the 1960s, when they first appeared, guys were saying, wow, we can get the food cooked for a third of the amount of energy that we'd used in the past, which was true. Which is true, absolutely. On the other hand, there are certain things you really don't want to cook with a microwave. You know, I think your beef wellington is not going to come out all that well. <laughs> Doesn't do well with steaks. <laughs> no, and and uh, or cakes. But certain things a microwave does very, very well. It's the best way to cook oyster stew. 
Is it really? Well, <laughs> makes it makes it a cup of coffee hot real quick. It does. Okay, we're up to Sunday already. Well, I think so. Must be having fun. Must be. Let's look at look at this. This picture looks familiar. Yeah, it does. I think we've seen it before. We've seen something like it. Well, we've seen lots of things. Lots like of it. things like it. Well, that's an offshore oil rig, in case you want to know. It's still an offshore oil rig, in oil rig, in case you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Clean Technica. What do you have? For no that? new oil and gas leasing! Exclamation point. Hearing on climate and offshore drilling. In a House committee hearing, committee members focused on the connection between offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and U.S. climate goals. This much is clear. Continuing offshore oil and gas leasing, as usual, will not help us meet our climate goals. And this has been the case for a long time. We've already got all the oil wells and all the gas wells that we need. That we need, really. Really. And, and you know. I got a quick takeaway. Go ahead. Every decision our, our leaders make, and that's what they're talking about, needs to consider a clean energy future. Yes. Not continuing our reliance on fossil fuels. Yes. The administration must move towards this future by offering a five-year program with no leasing. No new leasing. Yeah. Okay. Offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is definitely contributing to climate change. Absolutely. And the last thing oil and gas companies need is more leases. <laughs> they don't need them. Okay. Yeah, as Continue. a matter of fact... If you look into who's bidding on these leases, it's not the big companies. No. It's <laughs> investors, isn't it? It's speculators. It's, it's speculators. Yeah. This is just speculation that's going on here. These are wildcatters who's, who are financed by speculative bets. Well, continuing with lease sales without taking to the time to fully interrogate whether or how the enabled extraction will fit within our nature's futures is both reckless and irresponsible. Absolutely. Both of the above. Okay, our next item comes from CNN. We have a picture of got lightning. another picture there. That's a, that's, that's a picture of some thunderclouds and some lightning, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it reminds me of a, of a, of a lightning thunderstorm I saw up. over Northfield, Massachusetts, where the, there, was a, there was a cloud that was like a ball over Northfield. Uh -huh. And the top of the cloud couldn't have been more than about 200 feet above where I was, I was up on a mountain, and there were there were lightning flashes in that cloud about every second, every other second, <laughs> and there were there was blue lightning coming blue up, lightning, and blue, blue lightning, lightning. Wow. coming up from the cloud, rising up to the sky, and it was very short little bolts, but they were going up, going up, huh? and directly above the cloud yeah. was the moon. In a blue sky, <laughs> it was bizarre. That's interesting. Absolutely bizarre. It was Sounds interesting. I'll look gorgeous. at the picture again. Okay, there you go. What this? How is coronavirus lockdowns may have led to less lightning in 2020? Huh? This, this I think is really interesting. This is, it from is interesting. CNN. There's a link. There's always a link. Glo <laughs> Global lightning activity decreased nearly eight percent. Eight percent. That's a lot. Uh, in 2020, amid lockdowns triggered by the pandemic, scientists who worked on a study discovered the potential cause for this dry up in, in lightning activity, a decrease in atmospheric aerosols, tiny particles of air pollution. Well, these particles are produced basically through the burning of fossil fuels. Right. And they're suspended in the air all around us. Yeah. The aerosols give water droplets the in the atmosphere something to cling on to. Yeah. Okay. That's another reason why, with the with the with the um, uh, pollution, we have a potential for more rain. Yes, exactly. They can paint a picture of what's going on. These these uh, particles can paint a picture of what's going on across the Earth's atmosphere, from weather patterns to natural and man-made ev events. Yep. They have a profound impact on climate because of their ability to or alter the Earth's energy and balance. Having more droplets in the atmosphere makes it possible to get those collisions of water and ice to create electric charge imbalance, which right. leads to lightning. Yeah. Okay? There you go. So 65% of global cities experienced better air quality in 2020 compared to 2019. So we're making progress. 
84% of the nation's polls reported air quality improvements overall. <clears throat> so there is some good news here. Yep. Okay, our next item is from BBC. We got another picture here. And this here, area of, of um, California that you see in the picture is, in fact, the place where the Colorado fire was burning. That little hill that's in the, in, in, behind the bridge there had a big fire on it. There's a fire in the background, too. There is a fire in the background? Well, there's, there's burnt areas. Oh, yeah, there, there were burnt areas. That's correct. Burnt areas Okay, this is from the BBC. What do you have for a... For the, by the way, Colorado fire has nothing to do with the state. <laughs> what do you have to do... With, uh, what do you have for the title? Well, that's the Bixby Creek Bridge, for what it's worth. Yes. And it's been destroyed. Famous bridge. Surreal January wildfire shuts a California highway. And that's the highway that it shut. Yep. And, oh, you're going to read it. Yeah. An unseasonable wildfire fire is raging, or was at the time this was, this was written, um, on California's Big Sur Pacific Coast, forcing evacuations and closing Highway 1. That is Highway 1 crossing that... Interstate big, 1. In, yeah. Not um, Route 1. What's that? It's Interstate 1, not Route 1. Okay. Route 1's on the East Coast, Interstate 1's on right. the East Coast. The U.S. Uh, officials say the National Weather Service reported a, quote, surreal fire behavior given the wet October and December, end quote. It is called the Colorado Fire, and it burned about... Uh, has burned about 1,500 acres at That's the time. That's two and a half century. square miles. Yeah. There's a vi nice video there. Wildfires lighting up the night sky in California. Yeah. So if you, you want to go to that link, you can see it. The area where the blur blaze is burning had little or no fire history. Ah, interesting. The long-term drought is acting like a chronic illness where even the acid rains, even recent rains and cold weather isn't helping keep the fires from developing. Yeah. Now, that's a new development, I think. Yeah, I think it is. Climate change increases the risk of the hot, dry weather that is likely to fuel wildfires. That's what's really going on. Yep. Okay, we've got an item from CNN here. We're uh, up to Monday, the 24th of January. How do you keep them? Off your porch, huh? Well, I, I titled this picture Bovine in Inconvenience. <laughs> they don't like getting their feet wet. Uh, they don't. And I, honestly, I think it's inconvenient for the people who own the house, too. That, <laughs> that porch, A little bit. <laughs> that porch is tilting downwards under that cow. Um, and relative to the steps, I think there's a... There's, that porch has been damaged by the weight of the cow. I would say. I would say. And that cow, I don't think, has even fully grown yet. I think that's a... I think that's a heifer. I think you're right. I think it's a young, young. I think they all three of them are. Yeah. What do you have for a title? Humans do a poor job of calculating rich. risk. 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 That's terrible for the climate crisis. Yeah. Humans do a poor job of calculating climate risk and the cost of reducing it. Over the f past five years, extreme weather disasters have cost the United States more than $750 billion. That's a billion with a B. That's a billion with a B. This is big bucks. As long as we're talking about Bs. The, the Build Back <laughs> Better package would cost $555 billion. Billion over a course of 10 years. This is from the article. Never underestimate the power of the human mind to rationalize its way out of reality. It's, we are not logical. Anybody who thinks human beings are logical should talk to a computer. Well, despite year after year of climate change-fueled disasters, the world is no closer to capping fossil fuel emissions, which would halt the increasing severity if of we, natural if disasters. If we don't cap the fire, the, the climbing emissions, the climbing emissions are going to cap us. Well, the problem is that the people who own this fuel they don't want stranded assets. They want to sell it. Yeah. So they're doing all their best to, to ask keep, them if keep. they would like to sell their children. <laughs> Instead, emissions continue to rise among pledges and promises to rein them in. Well, that's what's, what's happening. Yep. The fantasy that we have for the planet is that some technologic invention will save us at the last minute. <laughs> it's a fantasy. It's probably true, though. 
we probably will, if, if, if we're saved, we're probably going to be saved by a, a last minute invention because we don't have, the, you know, we don't have the technology choice. that we've got is sufficient, but it we should have been put into use 20 years ago. Yep. What okay. we don't understand is that climate change tipping points will pull control out of our hands. Oh, I had a, I had a. We thought. continue to make the mistake of talking about climate change as a polar bear problem and not a people problem. Yeah, I know. Okay, let's get out of that. Let's Tom. move on here. We got. We have a picture, of, picture of, a, of, of a deluge. It certainly is. This is what what Louis the Fourteenth said would come after him. After after him comes the deluge. La belle deluge, deluge, huh? <laughs> Isn't that a sport? Deluge. <laughs> Deluge, yeah, yeah, it is. Climate change could open up rivers in the sky over East Asia. Yeah, well, we knew that it was already doing it over uh, uh, California. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? We can clearly see that the climate crisis is already having a profound effect on weather systems, altering temperatures, rainfall, wind patterns, and more. Now, a study predicts li uh, likely deluges over the mountains, uh, mountainous yeah, parts of deluge. East Asia in the future, with a result being, quote, atmospheric rivers, end quote. Well, atmospheric rivers are narrow corridors of concentrated moisture Yep. that can quickly cause flooding when it hit a barrier such as a mountain range, releasing vast amounts of water in a very short space of time. Atmospheric rivers pick up moisture from warmer areas and deposit it over colder regions. They bring unprecedented rainfall and will bring it under East Asia under global warming. Okay, we're going to go from there to Ireland. And we have O'Connell Street in an Irish town called Ennis. Looks like I've been to Ennis. Have you? It yeah. looks like a town I'd like to live in. This is from <laughs> CNN. Well, much most of Ennis doesn't look like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> looks like That's a town. That's the downtown to old, old Ennis. Yeah, okay. What That's you, where my, my ancestors come from. Oh, really? Mother, yeah. Well, good for you. At least on my father's side. Yeah. What do you got for a title for the article? Oh, I bet you we can find a title here. Bet you Ireland's can. data centers provide an economic lifeline, but environmentalists say they're wrecking the planet. A 1.2 billion euro investment in data centers in the, in the town of Ennis is likely to be welcomed by the Irish government despite concerns that growth in data centers would undermine the commitment to cut, cut, uh, cut carbon emissions in half by 2030. So they're talking about the, the, um, they're talking about the economy versus the possibility of new jobs and income. And the possibility of cutting carbon emissions. Yep. Well, on the outskirts of Venice in County Clare, Ireland, lies an unremarkable but huge plot of land. This is where a mysterious company has applied to develop a new data center the size of 22 American football fields. 22 football <laughs> fields. That doesn't count the end zones. Oh, it doesn't count. Well, you know, then it's okay. It is not clear what the data center will be used for. Data. Nor if other <laughs> large tech companies could ultimately be involved. Yeah. Well, I got a couple of things to say about these. Things. Oh, okay. Irish data centers are so energy needy that over the past four years, the power that they required was the equivalent of adding half a million homes to the grid. Oh, man. These things suck up energy. Yeah. Well, this they do data everywhere. center, which comp comprises the one we're looking at, well, we're not looking at it, comprises six two-story buildings <laughs> and, massive, and a massive 50,000 square foot energy center. It will utilize 18 natural gas engines and 66 backup diesel generators. What? <laughs> 66. The site is expected to emit the equivalent of 657,000 tons of CO2 per year. This is progress? Yeah. Well. Ireland still has a long way to go to meet its 80% renewables target by 2030. Yep. And is already showing signs of falling great, greatly behind. It was 2.5% below its 16% interim goal, according to the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland in 2021. Okay, we've got to move on, Tom. Here well, is... we're up to Tuesday, January 25. Well, thank you for saying so. And we've got a picture here. Of a, of a Roman fort. This is, um, I have read the 
the bath area of the fort. This is what? where the, the bath area. It's bath. Where, where the Roman soldiers did their... Took their baths? Took their bathed, baths. They bathed? They bathe? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know Roman soldiers People did in that. ancient Rome did. People in the Middle Ages did. Yeah. It wasn't until the Renaissance that people stopped uh, bathing and started oh. getting really gross. Well, this is a Roman fort. I'll keep it up there. Just south of Hadrian's Wall in northern England. I've seen Hadrian's Wall. Have you? Not very well, Hadrian built a wall to protect the Roman Britannia from the troublesome tribes in the north. Well, the Scots. Particularly you know. the Picts and the Scots. <laughs> they were causing, particularly Caesar, my, a lot of trouble. Yeah, my daughter and her husband live north they of Hadrian's Wall. They live in Scotland, don't they? They yeah. do. Yeah. Climate change is threatening buried UK treasures, and that's what they're talking about right now. Right. Climate change is threatening to destroy treasures buried in the UK as the soils that protect them dry out. So they're in peaty soils which, which protect them. And as, well, I'll explain that. Okay. About 22,500 archaeological sites in the UK are, may be in danger. The problem is that damaging weather patterns are drying out some of the peatlands and the waterlogged soils that cover about 10% of the UK. Well, peat contains very little oxygen. Yeah. So organic materials don't rot. Yeah. Okay. They can survive for thousands of years. Yeah. But as the soils dry, oxygen can enter the system, kickstarting the process of decomposition. There you go. So if that happens, artifacts can quickly rot away. And this, the last sentence is a, a host of historic sites in peatlands are under threat, covering the entire sweep of UK history. This article is from the BBC, and it has a bunch of pictures of things that have been found at that particular site. Yes, they have. I, you should mention that, because it's and, very interesting. Yeah, it is. Things like sandals made of leather. Things like people. People. Yeah, occasionally people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't be laughing about dead people, but... Well, they okay. died a long time ago, so you can't... Yeah, I suppose that's true. Here is a picture of a rendering of two Intel processor factories. Let's see if we can pull this one up. And uh, they, the um, article is from Clean Technica. So this isn't real, this is an artist rendering. It's a rendering, yeah. But they're pretty big. Those are big plants, and I don't know what part of what we're seeing is is one factory and what part is another. It's the... the well, it's an artist artist rendering, so yeah. we don't even know that they're going to look even, like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. The Intel will transform Ohio into a semiconductor chip epicenter. Intel announced that it will invest uh, uh, over $20 billion to build two new factories and establish an epicenter for advanced chip making in Ohio. The two leading-edge chip factories will help boost production to meet critical demand for advanced semiconductors. This is very sort of good news for the United States because we have been dependent on semiconductors that come from other parts of the world. Well, we're getting ready to make them ourselves. Yeah, we did in the past, and then that was taken over by Chinese, Chinese and yep. Malay, um, you know, Malaysia and so forth. Well, this is a big project. It, it spans is. nearly 1,000 acres. And it's the largest single private sector investment in Ohio history. It hardly so a surprise. A big, $20 billion is more money than I've got. Construction is expected to begin in late 2022 with production coming online at the end of 2025. Okay. The site can accommodate a total of eight chip factories. Okay. We should move on. I think so. Here we have a picture of energy storage facility. Oh, we do. That's just and this what it is looks from like. TV magazine India. For those who want to know, they're all batteries right down there. That's what it is. NTPC Renewable Arm, and I'll tell you what NTPC stands for in a second, tenders 500 megawatts, 3,000 megawatt hour energy storage projects. What is NTPC, Tom? National Thermal Power Corporation. Which, is, which gives you a clue as to where these guys are coming from. Well, it's thermal. an Indian corporation. It's an Indian corporation, but it's thermal, thermal. power, which means coal. This is a coal company. I didn't pick that one up, but... Yeah. 
NTPC is, I think it may be the biggest coal company in India. Renewable Energy Limited. So NT, NTPC has got a an energy... It's a subsidiary, subsidiary. of NTP, has, NTPC Renewable. is a subsidiary yeah. of NTPC Limited. They have invited <laughs> global bids to develop energy storage with a total of... 500 megawatts, 3,000 megawatt hours. So that's three gigawatt hours of capacity anywhere in India. The project shall be awarded through international competitive bidding following a reverse auction. Well, uh, you have to tell me what a reverse auction that's is. That's where all of the people who are bidding take over the podium and every single one of them has a gavel. <laughs> Well, the National Thermal Power Corporation is an Indian corporation, as already mentioned. Yeah. It's engaged in the generation of electricity and allied activities. It's owned by the Indian Ministry of Power. So that's the government. Yep. It's the largest power company in India. And TPC Renewable Energy Limited is a wholly owned subsidiary. Yep. So the government owns all of this. Yep. And the plants will range from 100 megawatts to 500 megawatts with the capacity to store at least six hours of electricity. So they know what they're doing. I think so. The energy storage system will be energized by renewable power generated by NTPC, okay, and will be utilized on an on-demand basis to meet its round-the-clock renewable power supply requirements. So okay. it's not only uh, a backup, it's all going to be renewable. Yes. Our next item is, and we're, by the way, we're up to Wednesday. Up to Wednesday, it's the last one. January 26th. We got one of these funny looking things It's one of these funny looking things here. It's one of those funny looking things. Nodding donkey a or nodding a, donkey. a pump jack. This is a particularly good example. You can get a real clear picture of what that thing well, looks like. Well, it's interesting. You see the little gray thing off to the side of the main frame? That's the motor. <laughs> oh, yeah, you mean on the left side. Yeah, it's on the left side. It's yeah. just got a little bitty motor running. Well, all it does is go up and down all day. Yeah, and, but that motor might be a 20-horse motor. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you drive through parts of the country, you see these things all over the place. Oh, I know they're you all over. You drive through West Texas, everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere. Okay, what do you got for a title for the uh, article? The U.S. working with allies to shore up energy supplies if Russia invades the Ukraine. We're back this to the This is Ukraine. all over the, the news, as I mentioned today. Yep. The Biden administration is making contingency plans to shore up Europe, Europe's energy supplies should a Russian invasion of the Ukraine cr uh, create gas shortages and roil the, the global economy. Senior administration officials said supplies of natural gas are especially important. That's now, like, that's roiling the economy, like yeah, running up the water. Yeah, you can bet that there are people in the Ukrainian government and other governments who have, who have decided that if Russia invades the Ukraine, they're going to bomb the existing pipelines that, that uh, are There's supplying natural Europe. gas to Europe. Yeah. And the reason they would do that is because that would be extremely destructive to the Russian economy. Big time. Big time. It would be destructive to the European economy. But, bigger to Russia. But bigger to Russia. I mean, Europe, and it would give the Europeans an excuse to get off gas, which is something they want to do. So. Well, Russia is the second largest oil producer in the world. Yep. Behind only the United States. Yep. So war between Russia and Ukraine could significantly affect global energy markets. That's right. And that's the, that's the lesson here, I think. Yes. Well, Russia also exports a large amount of natural gas to Europe through the Ukraine. Those exports would likely be severely disrupted by a war. Yeah. And as you just mentioned, by destruction of their pipelines. Right. And damage to critical in energy infrastructure. That's it. That's the pipelines. Yep. Biden discussed concerns over Russia and the Ukraine situation in a secure video call Monday with European leaders. Now, so they're we, all worried about we're in a, this. We're in a very peculiar arrangement here because Russia invaded invaded Crimea, they which took is part, come, of, they, part they, of the they Ukraine years Crimea, ago. They Crimea, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And, and so they were technically at war with Ukraine. Already. And they were shipping natural gas to the Ukraine <laughs> and, you know, charging for it. And the Ukraine was paying. Yeah. We're in a, we're in a weird 
It, well, arrangement. That, that is a pretty strange situation down there. We have to move on, Tom. We're getting toward the end of that well, we got another thing picture here. here. We've got a picture of the Victoria we, we, Big Battery. We just saw something very much like that. Yeah, we did. This is the big battery that Victoria got after it, it uh, saw what was going on in South Australia. Victoria is a state Australia. in Australia. That's right. It's, uh, I think if I were to live in Australia, I, Victoria would be the state I'd like to live in. But, you it's know, the, it's or either of, that it's or Tasmania. It's one of the smallest, but it's nice. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's in the south, e, southeast. Nice Tasmania climate. is just next south of it, and I, I might like to live in it's Tasmania. It's sort of... Sort of uh, Anyway, what do you have for a title here? This is from Pacific Clean Gas Tech. and Electric proposes a 6.4 gigawatt battery storage plan. This is 6.4. That isn't gig. it, by the way. <coughs> gigawatt hour. Last June, the California Public Utilities Commission issued a directive requiring the state's utility companies to install a total of 11.5 gigawatts of storage. That's a lot. That's a lot <laughs> between 2023 and 2026 to help replace the 2.2 gigawatt Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Now, it's a good-sized power plant. It is. And it's going out of business. It's going out of business. PG&E is proposing nine new battery projects totaling 1,600 megawatts, which is 1.6 gigawatts, and 6,400 megawatt hours, or 6.4 gigawatt hours. So basically this is going to store a lot of energy that comes out of wind power and solar power and and hydropower, whatever other power is out well, there. Take it when you can get it yep. and save it. And it's actually like a savings bank. because of the nature of batteries versus the load following plants that are required by nuclear plants, this is going to be a better quality power than it's replacing. And it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be better quality. It's going to be more reliable. There's no reason to do the other, do it the old way. No, there isn't, <clears throat> except we always did it that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, the nine new projects would bring PG&E's total battery electric storage system capacity to more than 3.3 gigawatts by yes. 2024. Yes. That expansion would make it the largest battery facility of its kind in the world. Yep. And these projects all feature lithium-ion battery technology with a four-hour discharge duration. Which is, um, is uh, there are other battery technologies that could also be used. And I mentioned Diablo Canyon was closing. So yes, you did. That's, a, that's enough to power two and a half million households. Yep. So we're not talking about hay here. This is significant. No, this is big. Okay, our last item, last item. is from got Clean a Tech. Here. We have a graph here. Let's of see if I can't greenhouse get a, gas come on initiative, you. Uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative allowance clearing prices for carbon dioxide. And there is the map of the regional greenhouse the, gas the, initiative. The last month, it was um, in the last quarter, it was the highest it, it has ever up. been. It's going up. It's in the previous quarter, it was the highest it's ever been. In the quarter before that, it was the, the highest, highest it's, it's ever been. been. What do you got? CO2 emissions allowance mm -hmm. prices increased in the latest RGGI auction. And the, we just mentioned what the RGGI is. We did. Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. The most recent um, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative quarterly auction resulted in a price of $13 per allowance. There it is again. It's going up, man. Yep. The previous auction set a record at $9.30. So it's gone up from $9.30, which was the record, to $13. Well, Each what's an allowance? Well, I'm about to tell you. That's why Each, I asked that question. Oh, <laughs> you're ahead of me. Each allowance represents a limited author, authorization for power plants to emit one short ton of carbon dioxide. So if they're going to emit 2,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, they got to pay $13 for it. Well, if you want to pollute, just buy an allowance. If you want what? If you want to pollute, just buy an allowance. Well, yeah, except you have to spend money, and it makes... It makes these coal burning plants and, and natural gas burning plants even more expensive yeah, not, compared not as to solar. And, yeah, they're not competitive. Well, this RGGI is a Marcus based regional effort to cap and reduce CO2 emissions from the electric power sector. That's okay? right. This latest auction sold 27 million CO2 allowances. 
an increase in 17% from the previous auction. Why don't they give us some of that money? <laughs> the December auction generated $350 million for the RGGI states. Okay, Tom, it's time for us to get off. Well, so uh, we, one more word in this Okay, thing. go ahead. Fini. Fini. <laughs> and we have a slide for you that says, have an exhilaratingly convenient week. Is that what it says? It's what it says. <laughs> you want to wave goodbye, Tom? Well, let's put me up here so let's I can. Let's put both of us up. Adios, amigos. Bye, folks. You all come back and see us now, you hear?